For the servo, this has been designed to fit a pretty standard size servo. Now, I know you can get some that are fairly deep. This is an Airtronics 94102, and this is the important dimension here. So I'll measure from the back of the flange to the back of the servo case, and we're looking at 24 and a half millimeters, is about an inch. The wires will fit on either side of the servo like that, and this should fit very nicely right in between you can see there just like that right, you can see here where the holes for the standoffs are so the servo will end up being round about there and there's still a little bit of room behind it for the servo standoff if you've got a standard tamiya plastic one it's going to work so these things have come with pretty much every tamiya kit i've ever owned i've got some metal ones here as well that would work these you can probably find a lot easier on ebay as a standalone part these are usually on a sprue standoffs are in let's go ahead and put the horn on and mount this all right so i've got the servo horn and i want to go ahead and center it so i'll just use my handy servo tool here and we'll just go ahead and set to neutral okay and we'll set this to manual I installed some two millimeter shank ball studs. These are standard to me affair. You can get them on eBay pretty easily. Basically, you wanna make sure that whatever you install here is going to work on the vehicle. And that's why I went ahead and got these because the ball diameter for the stock sand scorcher ball stud is the same well i mean it's the same part as these guys here these have a little hex head in the ball versus the hex on the side but it's the same size and next we'll screw the servo down servo is mounted and if we flip the car over you can see beneath that the servo screws the mounting screws are in a slot that's because you do have the ability to move the mounting position outboard slightly inboard as well but the hole that it comes with is designed for a standard servo and the width is 45 millimeters center to center the outer extremity is 55 millimeters and you can bring these inboard about a millimeter or so, but that's about it. Next, we should probably mount the speed control and the receiver, and this is gonna be the fun part and where people start getting mad at me. Because yeah, the speed control, receiver, and servo, you just gotta kind of wedge in here. I think this speed control can go here. I mean, this is plenty of room, right? What could go wrong? So I've bundled up the smaller wires here. This JST connector will go to this, and this is the remote on off switch. This is a weird speed control. The Tamiya 101 BK is kind of dumb in that you actually have to plug a power source into the power port right there. I don't know why that is, but it is. So we'll just plug that in here. Then this is for the lighting servo speed control. If you're wondering where the antenna mount is, uh, yeah, there's not one. I do not run antenna mounts on any of my cars with 2.4 gigahertz systems. I'll probably just put a little dab of hot glue on this sucker and stuff it right in there. The motor wires, let's see if we can just run these this way. I know running the motor wires next to the antenna is perhaps not the greatest idea, but this car, at least in my application, will never get very far. So we'll run this right here, plug that in. Now the battery wire, well, that's an interesting one. The battery is going to be in here under the car, so what we're gonna do is cut off this Molex connector here. Get as much meat as I can possibly get off of it. Then I'm going to run the wires in there. So I've got the wires routed and uh, take some advice from me. It's probably better to do this with the servo not there. So let me put some connectors on this and we'll be right back. So I've got the battery connector installed. I'm gonna deal with this wiring later. In the time being, we're gonna put this battery pack in. Now this is the battery pack I designed this to fit for. So uh, <laughs> let's just make sure it fits, shall we? I've been putting this off for long enough, so let's 
get rid of these wires. And what I'm gonna do is just kind of push them down a little bit like this, take a little bit of hot glue and just do a little dab of it right in there. And we'll do the same at the top. Now that the wiring is secure, we'll install the battery. Now up on the screen right now is a space claim of what the maximum size battery is in here. But what you have to realize too, is that you cannot use a battery where the wires come out the top. It'll have to be out the side so that the wires can go into the sides here. Now this is a prototype chassis, but the production one has a space from right about here and back on both sides completely open. So this entire area is open because it'll be a lot easier to install the battery. It also has a small wall right here, which prevents the battery from going too far over and coming into contact with these retaining clips. So basically the battery drops in here. We'll tuck that out of the way. And mine is a little bit snug, but basically it just goes like that, like that. And then you take the battery door, go in there and snaps right on. Now earlier I was messing with actually trying to take these in and out. And the reason is I didn't add a little grip on top. So I can't actually grab them with my finger. The production one does have a small little undercut. So you put your fingernail there and it'll pop it right off. For me, I have to use this tool, but nevertheless. So this is the battery pack that I tend to use and its sizes are 35 by 95 by 18. And it works really well. This is 2200 milliamps. And remember that as technology progresses, batteries will get smaller and smaller. So in a few years, I guarantee you that you'll have a 4,000 milliamp that'll fit in this space. That's why I didn't make this battery compartment any larger. It would have detracted from the interior of the car. When you solder the connector on this, make sure that the connector goes into the void here that is in the production chassis. There's no reason to keep it in this area where it's too tight. All right, battery door is on, car on. And let's install the front end. So we'll start with the actual suspension. You can use all the original hardware without a problem. However, for the shock mounts here, you'll need to use a longer M3 screw, and I'll show you exactly why. So this will just line right up here, just like that. And then this upper screw will thread straight through that hole. You can go ahead and uh, drill this out, but it should already have plenty of clearance because this is not going to be tapped or thread into. It is uh, simply a clearance hole because you're gonna put a nut on the inside. So the top cage mount has been installed. We just got a couple of M3 nuts. The screw that you're going to need here is an M3 by 22 millimeters or greater. These I believe are 28, so this is all I had. But you wanna make sure that there's enough thread to go through all of this, including a nut. If you're using a lock nut, make sure that there's enough thread to go through the locking portion of the lock nut. Next, flip the car back over and go ahead and install all of your original hardware. And we'll start with the M4s. It just occurred to me that on my car, I have this bumper and I don't know if that's going to fit. One way to find out. So the front suspension bulkhead is on and miraculously everything still fits with this. I guess it's not that surprising given that nothing in the front changed. Now the body mount slash steering bell crank has to go on. Well, I don't need the bell crank anymore. So I'm just gonna take that off and stick that down there and just go ahead and mount it. Now this is where people are going to start yelling at me. We have to install the tie rod for the steering linkage. And the problem with that is you can see the offset here between the servo and the steering arm. The tie rod has to go from here to here, which looks okay until you look at it from this angle and you can see how far it has to go. Now I find it highly unlikely that a straight tie rod is going to work. I'm gonna give it a go, but the first thing we have to do is reverse the side of the ball stub we wanna go ahead and put it on top or reverse the side of the servo horn where the ball studs are. I think in my application, I can't do that because this speed control is too big. For the front steering, here's what I've done. And I apologize for not doing this live, but I had to mess with it and figure out how it worked. So this is what I came up with. Here we had our M2 ball studs, and then we had the ones that were on the steering arm originally. What I did is I flipped them over from the bottom side to the top side. I used some some M2 threaded rod, bent this little S in here, and it works very well, if I do say so myself. I'm going to look up some slightly shorter or smaller servos. If this thing was able to scoot back about 10 more millimeters, which I believe you can get servos that size, then you should be able to have pretty much a straight linkage. But for this case here, I don't have that, so that'll work for me. That means our front steering system is taken care of, our throttle, taken care of. And next, let's deal with that on and off switch. 
Now here's the radio that we're going to use to basically put on top of the switch. If we flip it over, you can see the little hole there. Use an X-Acto knife or something sharp to clean this out. And now that this is all painted, we'll just get our flush cutters and cut this off. And then same over here. And we can cut the back of the wheel completely flat. You can get a little dab of model glue, put it right in there, and then drop the wheel on. All right, put some glue on it. We'll get our tweezers because it's tiny and drop the wheel right there. And just make sure it's roughly in the center. Round about there. And now we can go ahead and install that. The dimensions of this switch that's sticking out are 3.8 millimeters by 4.25 millimeters. You shouldn't need to use any glue to put this on because it doesn't press fit. Okay, so there's that. We'll just squish it down. And there is our on and off switch. And now you basically just left your transmitter on the back of the car. Let's install the door panels. So this is pretty simple to do. We'll flip the body over. My car doesn't have the side view mirrors because I'll be making some new ones for it. I hate the stock ones. But if it was there, you'll notice that basically the door panel will stop just at the beginning of the side view mirror okay so just line those up right there and you'll see here that the crease in the middle lines right up with the b pillar obviously the body is curved but the door panel is flat now the reasoning behind that was had i followed the contour of the body the 3d printing process would have given us a door panel with just hundreds if not more scallops of the 3d print because it would have been printed at a um, in a curve like this printing it flat gives us a very very nice smooth face nothing here was sanded at all this is how it came off the printer other than the paint of course to install it you could use some shoe goo i think that would work very well but the problem with shoe goo is then you got to clamp it down hold it in place i think for this application hot glue might work but again use your best judgment i will be using some hot glue right in this area when this is installed we'll just push it straight down and you get a nice bend right there and everything else will stay nice and straight so do that on this side and the other side is identical I did want to mention that on the side where the driver usually goes, probably is going to be best to trim this off. Driver's side's done, and so is the passenger side. You can see that on this side here, I've actually got a wire that runs to the lights, and it's able to snake right behind the back without any issues. It's nice and flush with the windows. Went ahead and wired up these LEDs if we turn them on now. You can see that all four LEDs are on. We'll show you how it looks on the other side in a minute. But right now what I wanna do is cover all these exposed leads with some liquid electric tape. If you're curious on how I did all this, episode 33 walks you through the entire thing. Now, if you are going to use the LEDs, you will need to trim off the bottom portion of this windshield. Basically under this curve here, it comes into contact with the lighting and unfortunately there's nothing really I could do. If you are not going to make the lights operational, you're all set. But if you are, again, just the area right under the curve. I want to install the seats and these are the seats that I used. They were very inexpensive and they fit quite nice. The figures that seem to fit very nicely are the seven inch tall figures from Stranger Things. So I've got 11 that will be driving. Here's Lucas now that I've modified him. Um, I've had to cut out a little bit from his pants to make sure that he bends enough. And now Lucas is obviously not a full grown adult. These are seven inch figures, but you can tell that an adult is much larger than Lucas's. So even though this is a seven inch figure, this guy's a little bit shorter. So he is measuring in at six inches or about 150 millimeters. I will not be going into how I modified the figure to get it to fit. That would be an episode all in itself. But just note that she did require being chopped in half and quite a lot of work to get her to fit in here. However, now that she does fit, I'm going to put a glob of hot glue right there and just set her right down on top of that. I've installed the passenger, painted his shirt up a little bit, drew a little beetle on it, and then put a Micro Machine beetle on his lap, like that's his RC car. Threw in a 3D printed basket that I found on eBay with another Micro Machine dune buggy, a little radio, some other random bits from these two dolls' cards. Yeah, I think we're done. This thing I wanna kinda of tuck a little tiny bit more out of the way. Actually, it's okay right there. I don't think it's gonna bother anybody too much. You can put the body on. Here we go, here we go. That's just the wire for the uh, lights on the car. There we go, got that there. 
that goes there. Snap, snap, we need a body pin. Have we done it? Oh my God, we've, I think we've done it. I think we've got me, it's just, it's kind of sad, right? You do all that work and now it's like, um, where's the interior? There somewhere. It's our battery compartment there. Oh, I can't believe it's done. Well, folks, this has probably taken five years, if not more. So this is, this is a very happy time for me. That is how you install this chassis and interior set if you so feel inclined. Should you? Uh, that's hard to say. This is a complicated kit. It, it definitely is going to weigh more than a standard scorcher. I can't see that it would harm the drivability very much and I, I am going to drive this. This is all designed to be cleaned out very easily so I have no qualms about actually getting this thing a little bit dirty. You do have a couple of options. You can get the parts on Shapeways or you can print them at home. My recommendation is if you've got an FDM printer to print the large parts at home and then on Shapeways go ahead and get the smaller detailed parts like the pieces for the dash. This way you've got a little mix of the, the bigger parts that are easier to print that are more expensive on Shapeways and the smaller parts that provide that extra touch of detail. If you you do not have a resin printer. If you do, then you can do some of those parts on the resin printer as well. Folks, I hope you enjoyed this video. I am uh, thrilled that this is done and I hope I never see a sand scorcher again. So thank you all so much for watching. Look at that. That is fantastic. And we'll see you next time.